thank you very much uh, to the IIEA and to the Irish Competition Authority for inviting me uh, today. I'm uh, very happy to be back in Dublin, where I come occasionally, but not frequently enough, uh, and where I would like to come more often. Um, I was uh, asked to talk about the globalization of competition law, and uh, I thought that I would uh, uh, talk about uh, three uh, types of issues, uh, which are basically uh, uh, centered around different periods, the end of the 1990s and the rise of competition law and what were the drivers behind the rise of competition law. Um, then the globalization of competition law, which happened during the 2000s uh, mostly. Um, and finally, the challenges of competition law since 2008. Um, so to give you a sense of at least seen from the perspective of, of uh, the OECD Competition Committee, uh, what I, we have seen. Now, a lot of you will know uh, already some of those things, uh, but I'm just going to give a personal uh, uh, view on those various events. Now, let me see if I can, oops, good. Okay, so let's start with the proliferation of uh, competition law uh, since the beginning of the uh, 1990s. It has been quite impressive, to be honest, because uh, if I, uh, yeah, I'll get to, right. Um, uh, since the uh, 1998, uh, for example, and so I didn't go back uh, very uh, long in the 1990s, more than 60 countries have adopted a competition law. Uh, you have to know that 120 countries today in the world, which is the majority of the countries in the world, uh, have a competition law. It means that uh, as late as 1998, only 60 of them had a competition law. Uh, so there's been a tremendous increase. And as you can see from uh, those uh, uh, names there, uh, there have been uh, adoption of competition laws in very different countries both developed and developing countries. Now, on top of this, uh, 63 countries have, in that 10-year period have also upgraded their laws. And I'm going to just say a few words about uh, the reasons both for the adoption of competition law and the upgrading of competition law. Unlike what you might think, I'm going to get it. Uh, and unlike what economists would like to think, it was not mostly because people or governments were absolutely convinced of the benefits of competition law that all those countries adopted a competition law. It mostly came through bilateral trade negotiations or regional trade negotiations, or in some cases, a multilateral trade negotiation. But it was always trade-driven. And the intuition behind this is the fact that when countries decide that they're going to liberalize their international trade, what it means, of course, is that each country is going to open up its border to the uh, products coming from the other country. Uh, it's willing to do this if it is reasonably and, and therefore willing to abandon some of the uh, trade restraints that they've used in the past, such as anti-dumping duties, for example, if the country is reasonably sure that the other country is going to deliver on its promise of open markets. Um, and one of the instruments that ensures that you as a country will be able to export to another country is the fact that you have a place to go to complain if there are anti-competitive practices in that country that prevent you from exporting there. So in other words, the adoption of competition law by the trade, uh, uh, in the, by the trade community has been seen as a compensation for the abandonment of the use of some of those most protectionist policies and most protectionist instruments which had been used uh, before that. Now, this has played in different uh, uh, ways. Uh, I took the example, for example, of bilateral trade agreement. Singapore, I was the head of the uh, WTO Working Group on Trade and Competition for seven years. And for seven years, I heard Singapore explain to the rest of the world why it was that it was a small open economy and therefore did not need a competition law. And then in 2004, 
Singapore said, but why don't we have a trade agreement with the US? And the US said, yes, we are willing to have a trade agreement with you, but you have to have a competition law because we want to make sure that all products can enter your market and we don't want to see any domestic anti-competitive practices preventing them. Therefore, Singapore the next year uh, adopted a competition law. Typical example. Similar example would be with the enlargement uh, of the EU, for example, or the association agreements uh, with the EU. And there, uh, Eastern European countries, Turkey, Egypt, North Africa, uh, uh, would be uh, uh, extremely good example of countries which were pushed through the trade route into adopting a competition law uh, uh, with various levels of, of uh, uh, requirement. Uh, depending on whether they were going to integrate the European community or they just wanted to be associated with the uh, European uh, community. These days, if you want to become part of an economic organization like OECD, or if you want to join the multilateral organization like uh, the WTO, you have to have a, commit yourself to having a competition law. So this is another uh, route. And why do people want, like China, be part of the WTO, it's because it facilitates external trades, uh, external trade as I mentioned uh, before. Now, there are a few cases where uh, it was not so much for the trade route that the competition law was adopted. Uh, that still doesn't mean that it was because people were sold on the benefits of competition. If I can take only one example, which is a striking example, uh, uh, South Africa, for example, which when there was the changeover from the old system to the new system decided to adopt the competition law, it was not because it wanted to make markets much more competitive. It was because it considered that the large multinationals had played the game of the apartheid and should be punished. And there were only two ways to punish them. One of them was to nationalize them, which was the natural tendency of the ANC, uh, uh, and which was, in fact, what the ANC wanted to do. But the ANC quickly realized that if it was going to nationalize uh, international firms, it was not going to get a lot of international support for its revolution. So it decided to go the other way, to adopt a competition law, which has, in ma as a matter of fact, worked very well in South Africa, because South Africa is a very active uh, 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 and, I would say, top of the line uh, uh, competition authority. So all this is to say that it should make economists humble because even though they believe in competition for good reasons, uh, those good reasons are not necessarily the reasons why competition laws have uh, developed. Second dimension is uh, that competition law in itself is useless. Competition law requires cooperation with other uh, parts of uh, public policies. Um, that's why it shows on a picture of complementary elements. Um, now, we have seen resounding failures, uh, the most uh, uh, important one of them being probably Russia, uh, which has adopted a competition law, but uh, when it moved to a market economy, uh, nevertheless, its GDP went down for five years between roughly 1990 and 1995 uh, because it didn't work at all the way it was uh, supposed to work. Uh, we have seen countries, and I'm going to come back to this, uh, more recently, uh, were, uh, which were agitated by revolution, even though they had a competition law and they had a measure of uh, economic democracy uh, because they were not the preconditions that would uh, make competition law useful. Now, this summarizes what one needs if one is to uh, have an efficient uh, competition law system. We need international trade, we've already mentioned this, uh, but we need also a rule of law. We need uh, 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 an effective elimination of corruption. We need the promotion of a competition culture. We need privatization. We need an industrial policy which would not be at odd with competition law. We need deregulation. Uh, and when you think about the countries such as Egypt, Tunisia, Jordan, they are, which are undergoing a very severe political crisis. It's interesting that those three countries were the countries that had the most active competition laws in that region. And yet, it led to very little trickle down of the economic activity. And the reason was not so much in their competition regime. The Egyptian competition regime, right from the beginning, did very well. 
uh, so did the Jordanian uh, competition. Uh, Tunisia was a bit different. Uh, it took longer for the Tunisian uh, competition regime uh, to get uh, to speed, up to speed. But what happened is that you had this pocket of competition, free market, but you had an enormous amount of regulations coupled with quite a bit of corruption, which prevented any trickle down of the benefits of competition from those markets to the rest of the population. Uh, if you read uh, Hernando de Soto, who did a massive report uh, about uh, six or seven years ago on the Egyptian economy, explaining why it is that most of the Egyptian firms are in the informal sector because uh, property rights are not well protected, because there are uh, tremendous uh, uh, regulate, regulatory obstacles uh, to uh, uh, economic activity. So really, we must realize as competition authorities that it's great, it's necessary to have a well-functioning competition authority uh, making decisions on sound basis, but in itself is going to be insufficient to really promote competition uh, in a country and get the benefits that we expect from uh, such policy. Um, this didn't come easily. I mean, it was not obvious for a long time that competition policy needed, and it's still not obvious in the minds of competition authorities. I will come back to this uh, later on. Oops. Soft harmonization. Uh, the 1990s, and this is the second uh, uh, thing, I, major thing I wanted to talk about, uh, has been a period of great soft harmonization between competition authorities and between competition regimes throughout the world. This has come, I mean, of course, in Europe, we're completely aware uh, uh, of this. First of all, because we had quite different ideas about competition than the US, and we still have to a certain extent. Um, based on the fact that some of the goals of the European competition law were different from the US uh, competition law, market integration being the most obvious difference, which led to a number of cases on vertical restraints, which may not have uh, been dealt with in the same way uh, in the US. Um, second, difference in legal tradition and um, the respective uh, trust that one can have in markets reforming themselves on the one hand and governments intervening wisely on the other hand, with obviously much more uh, feeling that government could intervene wisely in Europe than there was in the US. Uh, different relative weights given to real versus potential effects. Uh, different position on uh, the issue of short-term concern versus long-term uh, concerns. And finally, a different value between efficiency and fairness, or a different uh, balance of value between efficiency and fairness, as a result of which we did have a competition law in Europe, which until uh, very recently was markedly different from uh, the competition law uh, in the US. Now, why did we move towards this uh, soft harmonization that we've seen? Because of trade, another time. It's not so much because somebody won the intellectual argument. Uh, the most emblematic case I can think of in this era is the British Airways Virgin Atlantic case of the 1990s, where the same issue was put by the same company, Virgin Atlantic in this case, about a possible abuse of dominance or monopolization case against British Airways on the North Atlantic route between, uh, uh, between uh, the UK and uh, uh, the Northeast of the United States. With the two, the Supreme Court on the one hand, uh, and the European jurisdiction coming out with different results on the same practice, saying those fidelity rebates that British Airways has installed are uh, very good for consumers, this was the US Supreme Court way, uh, are unjustified uh, from the cost point of view, this was the European approach. Now when we get to a level of contradiction on markets which are transnational, it is true that the business community gets uh, very uh, upset uh, for right reason. And it is true that because there is so much trade between Europe and the US, Authority says we've got to do something about being closer together. Now you have here the impressive movement, uh, the vertical restraints, which was reformed uh, in 2000, the Regulation 1 2003, uh, the new merger test in uh, December 2003, uh, the report of the European Advisory Group on Competition Policy advocating a more economic-based approach for 
uh, abuse of dominance in 2005, and finally the guidance paper of the Commission on this. Uh, great movement of Europe towards a more economic-based approach, closer to uh, what was true on the other side of the Atlantic, much required by the international uh, trading community, uh, which uh, thought that the cost imposed on them and the, uh, uh, the, yeah, the cost imposed on them by different interpretation of competition law uh, ha had to, to go. Now, this movement of soft harmonization not only happened between important trading partners, but it also happened through international organizations. The OECD, the ICN are two of those organizations promoting soft harmonization beyond the major players. And there's been a great uh, uh, tendency for competition laws to converge, even though we know that in some areas the convergence is not uh, yet uh, perfect. International cooperation. This has gone again with internationalization of trade. Internationalization of trade means that in any country, there may be anti-competitive practices which are implemented by firms which are not located in the country, but are located elsewhere in another country where the competition authority of the country affected doesn't have any means of intervention or means of investigation. And the only way to solve those problems, in other words, to allow national competition authorities to be able to implement the law in an efficient way in an open world is to have some kind of cooperation uh, uh, on cases with uh, other jurisdictions. So we have seen, now, international cooperation is not only cooperation on cases, it can be uh, also cooperation on, on uh, 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 technical cooperation, on various aspects, and it can be also uh, the ability uh, to promote uh, good practices uh, uh, between uh, competition authorities. Now, we've seen a huge development of cooperation. Some of it has failed. What has failed is the multilateral cooperation, which was envisaged by the European Union in the context of the WTO uh, at the beginning of, I mean, right uh, at the beginning of the Doha round. Uh, eventually that uh, failed, but at the bilateral level, at the regional level, at the plurilateral level, and at various levels of cooperation, whether it's consultation, exchange of non-confidential information, joint investigation, uh, teaching, uh, whether it's optional or mandatory, we've seen a huge development of uh, cooperation agreements which have changed the face of the world. Now, what is true is, however, those cooperation agreements have developed in a particular way. Uh, as I said, between the U.S. and the EU, on most cases, there's real deep cooperation that extends all the way to cooperation on individual cases. Uh, we had at OECD not so long ago uh, a peer review of Turkey, and, uh, which was the second peer review of Turkey. We had had one before, and us had in the first peer review, we had suggested to Turkey that it should cooperate more closely with other jurisdictions. And the second time around, after five years, we asked the Turkish minister, so what have you done in the era of competition to uh, cooperate more deeply with other jurisdictions? And the minister said, well, we've had two cases. Two cases. There's one was in the coal business, and the other one was in the, uh, in the electrical appliance business. And in both cases, it seemed to be uh, market sharing, which was implemented in Europe, but was affecting Turkey uh, in the exports. Uh, okay. So we wrote to the European Commission, and we said, could you help us, because this market sharing agreement seems to originate in your jurisdiction. Could you investigate for us, and uh, could you help us apply our own <coughs> domestic law, give us the evidence that would allow us to do this? Uh, the Turkish minister then said, then we got two letters. The first one said, well, we're not going to cooperate with you because we're not in the process of giving confidential information on our own domestic firms, uh, so we're not going to do uh, anything. Uh, this was the, uh, I think it was the, the trade division of the EU. And the next time they wrote to the competition division of the EU and said uh, for the second cartel, and they said, we got a second letter. They said, well, we're very busy, okay, so why don't you, uh, and, and we have our own, uh, prioritization principles, so come back in five years and maybe we'll, if, if we have time, uh, we'll think about investigating. So, and this is fairly typical of the lack of cooperation between developed and developing countries, 
not because they are developing, but because the volume of trade is very imbalanced. And if you have a very imbalanced volume of uh, exchange of trade, uh, uh, volume of exchanges, uh, you don't want to cooperate with a country when you're always going to be the one who has to supply the other country with information on your firms. Okay? So between the US and, and, and the EU, between the US and Japan, between the EU and Japan, this works fine. But between uh, uh, some African countries or Latin American countries, uh, even between Brazil and the US, uh, uh, there are difficulties. So a lot of cooperation, absolutely necessary because of uh, trade globalization, uh, but uneven in their development uh, uh, because of the uh, factors uh, which I have uh, mentioned. Um, in terms of cooperation, as I said, it's not only case cooperation, it's also the dissemination of uh, good practices. I've taken two uh, examples here. Uh, dissemination of a common policy goal. This would be the OECD hardcore Qatar recommendation. We are all agencies of the world going to go after hardcore cartels, and we're going to try to help each other in, with the caveats which I've mentioned earlier, uh, in uh, uncovering them and eliminating them. A second type of uh, uh, cooperation is on good, developing good practices and disseminating good practices. And this would be typically what the ICN does in its recommended good practice, and certainly the most notorious of them are for merger analysis, but they have been uh, also uh, issuing uh, recommendations and best practices in uh, other areas as well. Okay. One of the results of uh, the development of uh, laws, of the harmonization of laws, and the uh, cooperation between competition authorities together with the development of new instruments uh, and leniency programs are uh, very uh, important. And they, by the way, the leniency program, just like the increase in the powers of investigation of competition law, of competition authorities, explain to a large extent the revisions of competition laws that we've seen uh, at the very beginning. So there's much stronger enforcement. Now, I don't have to uh, give you, uh, I mean, you are, all aware, at least those of you who are lawyers uh, are very aware of the increase both in the US and in Europe and also in many other jurisdictions of uh, the increase, uh, the clear increase in trend uh, uh, in uh, the level of sanctions. If I take administrative sanctions now in Europe, we have the same uh, kind of trend uh, that you can see on the table to, to the left. Uh, or if I take the uh, cases where the highest fines have been taken, we also have the same kind of, uh, and we see that 2007 seems to be a breaking point. After two, between 2007 and 2008, there seemed to be an extraordinary increase in the level of the fines. Which means what? It means that competition is taken more seriously. It means that through cooperation, through mutual understanding, uh, there is much uh, higher level of consensus on the wisdom of this uh, policy. But it reveals another important issue which uh, came to the fore in the 1990s, which is the difference between the legal approach to competition law and the economic approach to competition law. Economists are used to thinking in terms of deterrence. And deterrence basically say, you're going to deter a violation only if you make it unprofitable for uh, the firms to enter into this violation. Which basically means that uh, when you catch them, you have to sanction, sanction them by a, uh, an amount which is the illegal gain multiplied by the inverse of the probability of them being caught. Which means you should give them sanctions which are not proportional to uh, the damage that they have uh, uh, caused, but which should be much more important than the damage that they've uh, caused because they knew that they uh, uh, were not necessarily going to be caught. Unless you do this, you're not going to dissuade uh, firms from entering into anti-competitive practices, and you're not going to be very efficient. Typical uh, economic outlook on those issues. Then you've got the legal uh, uh, approach, which is uh, much different, uh, and basically holds that uh, there should be some proportion between the severity of the violation and the uh, punishment of the violation. And the, those two notions clash. Uh, 
and they have clashed in a number of ways. One of them is at the level of the European Union, where there's been more and more call for restraint on the part of the uh, European Commission, or for calls for the fact that, well, if they are going to give that level of fines, uh, maybe due process uh, should be, uh, uh, I mean, the, their procedures should be revised to ensure more, uh, better uh, respect for due process. Uh, uh, maybe there should be an independent agency that would uh, give the sanctions, which would be different from uh, the European Commission. Uh, this has surfaced also in uh, various countries in Europe, and in particular in France, uh, um, with several qu severe questioning on the part of the judges of the wisdom of this considerable increase in the level of the fines pushed by uh, the economies of competition authorities who are looking for deterrence. Uh, there are a number of, of ways in which this uh, debate is uh, playing. Uh, one of them is uh, uh, the fact that in some countries, one of the ideas has been that, uh, to say, well, uh, if we have civil sanctions or if we have administrative sanctions, we're always going to face this propor proportionality issue beyond a certain level, and this certain level is going to be below the deterrent level. So we've got to look somewhere else. Two areas, criminal sanctions, uh, maybe we should have on top of sanctions for the firms, we should have criminal sanctions, we, we, which we cannot have at the European level, uh, but uh, could have at the level of individual countries, or personal sanctions. Uh, the intuition in both cases is that, uh, uh, first of all, you would multiply the uh, sources of sanctions, uh, so that in itself would uh, make for a more uh, deterrent uh, uh, mechanism. But second, also, that criminal sanctions or personal sanctions, such as the fact that you cannot continue to be on boards of firms and so on and so forth, that you have some professional uh, 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 impairment, uh, cannot be transferred to third parties, whereas financial sanctions for firms may be transferred either to shareholders or maybe even possibly to the consumers uh, uh, in the end. Um, this debate is still going on uh, right now. Uh, it's well known for those of you who are involved in, in, uh, in EC uh, proceedings that there is a, a very strong uh, movement uh, at the EC level to uh, try to either improve uh, the procedures or uh, to uh, lessen the level of fines, but it does reveal a split which is not entirely solved between the legal approach and the economic approach to uh, competition law. Third part is uh, the most recent part. Uh, the financial and economic crisis obviously have created uh, uh, questions and challenges for competition authorities. Um, I'm not going to go back to you know, what led to the economic crisis, but I'm going, I'm going to try to uh, say a few words about the consequences of the crisis for antitrust enforcement at two levels, in the short run and in the longer run. In the short run, what should be the position of competition authorities? And there have been basically three types of position. Complete denial, that would be Nelly Cruz, 2009, it's business as usual, nothing has changed, okay? So we keep on applying competition law as if uh, there had never been a crisis. Um, panic, this would be more like the French government, uh, to be, but the French government was not alone, by saying, oh, well, the commission probably has better things to do than to look at competition issues, uh, when in particular the French were subsidizing the automobile industry, which was in very bad shape. Uh, uh, and the French were quite upset at the idea that maybe those uh, financial aids, uh, state aids, uh, would not pass the test of the uh, European. Uh, uh, so the idea is, well, we should abandon competition in a period of crisis. And there's a middle ground, and I'm going to plead uh, in favor of the middle ground, which is adjustment. By the way, the adjustment is made possible by the fact that in the previous period, as I said, when there's been uh, harmonization, Harmonization for Europe has meant that we've moved from a form-based to an economics-based approach. Okay. Well, what changes in a period of crisis is the economic environment in which the firms operate. And if you believe that uh, their uh, practices should be uh, looked at in the context in which they've been implemented, when this context uh, is changed, there are a number of adjustments that uh, you can make. 
What has changed? Uh, well, change in the competitive environment uh, due to the crisis, uh, decreased in demand, uh, decrease in international trade, which basically means decrease in the intensity of competition, even though now international trade is getting back pretty much to uh, where it was before the crisis, but uh, there, this is uneven, I would say. Uh, more failing firms and uh, scarcity of available funds for investment, particularly for investment of firms who want to diversify in other sectors. All this points to one thing, which is the fact that potential competition diminishes, decreases in a period of crisis. And therefore, you don't look at some of the practices uh, uh, in the same way. Uh, and on top of this, is you have an increase in the poverty level of a large segment of the population. Second type of environment, or second issue of environment, which has changed, which is all the consequences of the policy responses to the crisis, what governments have done to try to uh, ease the pain of the, uh, of the crisis. In some countries, we're fairly, uh, uh, I mean, it's not so much in Europe because of European policy, but protectionist policies have been uh, put in place, discriminatory fiscal stimulus packages, or there's been a strategic use, and this we see right now in the US, we see in China, strategic use, strategic use of public procurement uh, in order to protect the domestic firm uh, over uh, foreign firms. Now, what does this mean for a competition authority? Well, first of all, case selection may be affected by this changing environment. Uh, if there's a larger segment of the population who is very poor, you may, competition authorities may want to take up some of the issues which are closest to the uh, heart and to the uh, welfare of the people who are, have lost their jobs. And uh, in the prioritization uh, of cases, uh, clearly you're going to have a different case selection than you would have in a, an expanding economy. Interim measures uh, in countries where you can, uh, the competition authority, authority can give interim measures, there are going to be many more requests for interim measures because there are many firms that are on the verge of uh, bankruptcy uh, and do not have time to wait for full uh, investigation. So the criteria under which uh, uh, preliminary injunctions or interim measures are going to be given uh, may be adjusted. Cartel enforcement is probably going to be on the rise because the first reaction when you have a sudden uh, decrease in demand is for firms to try to uh, work through this by uh, sharing what is left uh, uh, of the market. Abuse of dominance and vertical restraints. Now, a lot of abuse of dominance case and vertical restraints turn around uh, the issue of whether or not potential competition is strong enough to make those practices innocuous. Now, which we have said that in a time of crisis, when it's very difficult to find funds to invest uh, uh, and to develop into new fields, potential competition is much less strong than it is in periods of expansion, which does mean that some of the practices, some of the vertical practices, may be much less, uh, uh, I mean, much more bothersome from the point of view of competition than they would be in an expanding uh, environment. Mergers, the failing firm defense may be more often uh, invoked because there are uh, uh, mergers which are justified more frequently now by uh, failing firms. And finally, some merger remedies which were possible, like divest, okay, we will allow your merger uh, even though it's anti-competitive, but under the condition that you divest this and that asset. Now that assumes that you will find somebody ready to buy those assets. It assumes that you have a capital market, which is the kind of capital markets that we had when we had expanding economies. In periods of crisis, it may not be possible to implement such structural remedies. Then possibly there's a need for a shift to more behavioral remedies, just because structural remedies are not uh, uh, possible. Uh, okay, so those are a lot of adjustments. As I said, all those adjustments are made easier for us, thank God, because we move from a form-based to an economics-based uh, uh, approach. Now, if we look at the longer term, did, did we learn anything from the crisis, and is there something to think about? Well, certainly the one thing that we've learned is that competitive markets can fail, uh, which was not exactly what uh, uh, we thought. 
uh, everybody will tell you that the real estate market in the U.S. was uh, a booming market. It was competitive. Uh, the banking market was competitive, and they both failed uh, uh, together. Um, and that those economic failures uh, can involve both failure on the supply side and on the demand side. On the demand side, people behaving irrationally and taking loans when they should have taken loans uh, if they had been rational. On the supply side, uh, banks offering those loans because they thought that they could pass on the risk uh, to other firms. Okay, uh, we were also alerted to the fact that when uh, competitive markets fail, there are unintended uh, uh, distributional issues that come up. Some people are more vulnerable than others, and they, are, they tend to suffer more from those failures. So what it does tell us is that competition is not the end of the story. Uh, it does tell us that uh, there's a need to address the issue of market failure due to bonded rationality, something that some economies, not the mainstream competition economies, but the behavioral economists, have been claiming for quite some time. Um, now, it also means uh, it has uh, a consequence also uh, on the fact that, uh, now, what do I say this first? Say because we may have a completely, uh, uh, a completely competitive market that doesn't work for the benefit of consumers, which does not maximize consumer welfare. Uh, and here, in terms of services, particularly in terms of banking services, uh, uh, it's quite clear that the markets may be quite competitive seen from the point of view of competition law, but not work very well for consumers seen from the point of view of consumers. So if the object of competition law is to maximize consumer welfare, even in, in, in a general way, uh, what this suggests is that there should be a combination of uh, policies consumer policy together with competition policy to achieve those goals, and probably also uh, a combination of instruments, because only with the competition instruments you're not going to be able to eliminate some of the difficulties due either to bond and rationality or asymmetric information that uh, will uh, present the market. Now, I know that this is an issue that you discuss in Ireland these days, but uh, I just wanted to uh, make the point that I think that because of the crisis, we've learned a bit more that it is not so wise to do as the UK uh, uh, is uh, doing, which is to separate uh, consumer uh, protection or consumer policy from competition policy. Uh, on the contrary, I mean, it is the combination of the two which is a uh, winning combination. Um, I take just one example to show how some decisions might not be the same now as they were fairly recently. The Microsoft decision. One part of it was based, uh, which was on the, uh, uh, the fact that uh, uh, Microsoft uh, included the uh, Windows Media Player in its operating system. What was the accusation of the uh, European uh, Commission? Uh, the fact that by giving you something free in your uh, operating system, you limited the choice because it was all, you know, it was all in there. Uh, and there is a paragraph of the decision, 958, in contrast, the importance of consumer choice uh, and innovation regarding applications such as media players is very high. Now, one of the lessons of behavioral economics is that there are plenty of circumstances where people don't want to have too much choice because it's too complicated to choose and they like to have bundled products. Okay. Uh, the Microsoft decision, as a matter of fact, itself was an extremely good example of this because there were very few takers for the uh, version of uh, Windows without the media player, which shows that people didn't mind having the media player. As a matter of fact, they liked to, uh, not to have to bother with the media player. Now, this is typically a decision which does not does not take into account the fact that consumers may have bond and rationality and assumes that people just like more choice, whatever the circumstances, a, a, something which is more difficult now uh, to uh, assume uh, than used to be the case. Last issue is competition advocacy, and this is a typical, uh, uh, a typical meeting where the competition authority is advocating competition with government officials. This is what you get uh, uh, in general. Um, competition advocacy has become, oops, sorry, uh, Hmm. That's, I'm going to finally get it 
No, it doesn't want to stay there. Yeah, okay. Why is it more important now than it used to be the case? It's more important now than it used to be the case because, because of the economic and financial crisis. Uh, there is this feeling that government may be the solution rather than the problem, as uh, we thought in the 1990s. And in many areas of economic policies, you've got more put it, policy intervention from governments. The question is, to what extent are competition authorities allowed to say something uh, about those uh, government interventions? I do remember vividly in 2009, we had a debate on this at uh, uh, the OECD in the Competition Committee, and I remember uh, Bill Kovacic, who was then the uh, chairman of the FTC, uh, talking about the bailout of General Motors in the U.S. and said, you know, when the government started saying that uh, we're going to bail out General Motors, I stayed close to my phone, just in case I would get a phone call either from the, tre uh, from the Treasury or from the White House. Never got a phone call. Never asked my opinion. Never even raised the issue of, well, maybe that's going to create some competition problem on the, uh, in the automobile uh, market. Uh, and there, there is an important issue. Uh, I mean, there are three important issue, uh, issues. Uh, first, to what extent can competition authorities come up with the right kind of arguments? I'll come back to this. Second, do competition authorities have a vision of what is being done outside the field of competition, but which may have an impact on competition? And third, do competition authorities have access uh, so that they can deliver a message on the benefit of uh, keeping competition. Let me talk about access first, because I just mentioned it. Why were the FTC not consulted? Because the FTC is an independent agency. And it, because it was the executive who, was decided, who had decided that they wanted to bail out General Motors. So it didn't even come to their mind to ask an independent agency, not part of the executive, uh, to give an opinion. The more independent you are, which is very good for competition law enforcement, the more irrelevant you are in terms of advocacy vis-a-vis uh, -vis the rest of government. And advocacy vis-a-vis -vis the rest of government is more important now than it was before because there's more government intervention. Real issue there. Uh, there are different models in the world. There are competition authorities where uh, uh, the head of the competition authority is a cabinet minister, for example, and therefore sees what's going on uh, in due time. Uh, I think that the lesson there is not to make competition authorities less uh, independent, but it is to make sure that within the executive, within the administrative structure, there are some people who are in charge of competition, not only in the independent agency, but also uh, in uh, the government. And this is often uh, lacking uh, uh, and missing. And I know this because in France we've made that mistake. We had a very good law that was passed not very long ago that moved merger control from the hands of the Minister of Finance to the independent agency. But in the process of doing this, which was a very good move, we killed pretty much uh, the competition division of the Minister of Finance. So there's no one to advocate for competition anymore now within the structure. The competition agency can, of course, uh, uh, when it uh, uh, is aware of a problem, can emit opinions. But it doesn't sit in the kind of meetings where decisions are made uh, and where decisions can have a huge impact on competition. Vision. Competition authorities love to uh, talk to each other. They do this with uh, great gusto uh, all over the world. And they don't like to talk to anybody else. And this is a big mistake. It is a big mistake. Why? Because of the second slide. Uh, you do not have competition law enforcement is useless unless it is part of a real competition policy, which includes industrial policy, trade policy, and, and many other policies. OK, so uh, this is a definite weakness. Last weakness, data. It is extremely hard at OECD. We have tried in many different ways to try to uh, get good data on how competition law enforcement improved macroeconomic uh, performances. Uh, relationship between competition law enforcement and growth, competition law enforcement and innovation, or even the deterrence effect of uh, competition law enforcement given the very high level of sanctions, which I've mentioned before. Now, it's very difficult to do. We have not succeeded at OECD, and I don't, as far as I know, nobody has really succeeded. So what we are left with is either a theoretical reasoning which is uh, standard economic theory, but that doesn't sway uh, uh, ministers or uh, government officials. Uh, they are not, uh, and on a personal basis, I had my first 
professional experience was in this era. I was a, in the cabinet of uh, Mr. Barr, who was then the Prime Minister of France, and who introduced in uh, 1972 merger control to France. And because it was important, he was an economist, he had been with the European Commission. He said, well, as a Prime Minister, I'm going to introduce the bill myself in Parliament, and then Madame Scrivener, who was the minister in charge, will take over. So he called me and said, you're going to write the speech that I'm going to present to the National Assembly. And I wrote a wonderful speech on the benefits of merger control, uh, how it was going to improve allocation of resources, protect consumer surplus. And, and he called me in the night before uh, he was going to appear at the National Assembly. He said, did you write that speech? I said, yeah, 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 yeah. And it's a pretty good speech. I put everything I'd learned in university. He said, look, no one in parliament cares about allocation of resources. They don't even know what it means, much less consumer surplus. So you're going to redo the speech. You're going to say it's going to reduce inflation. I said, so minister, prime minister, you know that's not true. You're an economist. He said, Jenny, you want the bill to get through or you don't want the bill to get through? If you want the bill to get through, you have to use arguments that they will understand. By the way, inflation was at two-digit level at the time. It's now one digit. I don't think it has anything to do with the competition <laughs> law, but, but it was a very appropriate. Uh, so the question is really what kind of argument, if you do not have easy to understand uh, macroeconomic confirmation of the benefit of competition, what can you base uh, yourself on? Uh, I think that between theory and concrete, discrete examples, a lot of discrete examples can make a uh, very good uh, point. Altogether, you do need competition, particularly in the aftermath of the crisis, and competition uh, and competition authorities need to take on board the fact that the world is not quite the way it used to be. Thank you very much.